Okay, so what happens to a person who doesn't have that? Or who's not allowed to have that? You ask the question that, you know, about God or about Satan or about heaven and hell, and you don't get an answer, and in fact you are reprimanded, then that person will respond, will react. And one of the ways that they are likely to react is to leave the faith. Okay, you don't have any answer for me. And you believe in something that you cannot explain, and you know, I can do without that. So they leave the faith. Or maybe they leave it inwardly, but not outwardly, and they become hypocrites. Like, sure, I don't want to displease my father, don't want to displease the Imam, you know, so I'll still go to the mosque and maybe I can pray, maybe I won't do, will do, there's no need, you know, and also um, I won't do anything um, offensive in my parents' presence or hopefully where anyone can see, but if I'm by myself, then why not just have a good time? Okay, because ethics, cannot hold you if the basis of those ethics is nothing but formalities. Okay, that never works. You've got to be trained to be ethical. And not only do you have to be trained, but you know, you need to have a metaphysical foundation for that ethics. And then you see the cosmic meaning of truthfulness, of courage, of generosity. And you see also that I cannot be human and violate this. Okay? That's, then ethics becomes real. You know, then it becomes sincere. And then it becomes something that you will do no matter where you are, whether somebody's watching or not watching. Okay? This is absolutely essential. Religion without this is nothing. It's a dead letter. So that's what happens. A lot of people will leave the religion or they will become hypocrites, which is like leaving it without going out the door. And then there's the other response. And the other response is externalization. That person becomes an externalized Muslim. And what we mean by that is that they just hold to the forms, the do's and the don'ts. Islam becomes just the things we do and we hold to that tightly because it's all we've got. And the externalized Muslim um, is the one <coughs> who, by virtue of his or her externalization, has no access to the heart. Because the heart is the inward, the batin, the inward. It begins with the heart. And in fact, it is the heart. That's where it all takes place. So they don't have access to the heart. Because you cannot have access to that without these higher things. You couldn't even understand what the heart is without those higher things. You know, in your chest is a piece of flesh, which if it is sound, everything else is sound. And if it is unsound, everything is else else is unsound. Okay, the Prophet here and in other hadith and in the Quran is speaking about the muscular heart. But how can the muscular heart have anything to do with spirit or thought or love? Well, it does. It does. But that is a metaphysical truth. And we can explain it to you. But it's metaphysical. And this comes out of the haqqaiq. You know, and then you see also, and, you, and, and this is things that you'll find in our incredible tradition. You know that when I talk about the heart, the qalb, I'm also talking about the nafs, the psyche. And I'm also talking about the spirit, the ruh. And I'm also talking about the aql. And I'm also talking about your fingernails. Okay, can you make sense of that? Can you compute that? Well, with the right metaphysics, you can do it in a minute. When you know the organic connection 
of all these things, you can do it in a minute, and then you'll be able to begin to bring reality together. Okay? But the externalized Muslim, he wouldn't even read that book. Okay? Maybe he was even told that, you know, that's bid'ah. Because everything looks like bid'ah after that. You don't recognize anything in front of you. So that externalization is very dangerous. And in that externalization, it's very likely to produce fanaticism. Okay, and fanaticism always reflects lack of certainty. The fanatic in his or her fanaticism is declaring their certainty, but they're declaring it externally. And in such a way that to anyone who understands means you don't have it internally. And this is why the Prophet warned us about that. He warned us about excessiveness and other things and that it's not good for your religion. It will overcome you. And in the end, you may be left with nothing. So the externalist, don't expect him to have good manners because good manners requires introspection. It requires access to the heart. And don't expect him also to be at peace with the world around him because he doesn't understand anything. All that he can see is that it's not the way it ought to be. And often the externalized Muslim, and this would be true also of similar people in other faiths. Fanatics have many things in common. And in the modern age, they do many of the same things. They love technology, for example. And often they love technology because it puts in their hands the power to destroy. And destruction is one of the things that makes a lot of sense to them because everything is wrong. Nothing makes any sense. Okay, this is a plague. And people who are caught in that syndrome, and let's be very careful, I should be more careful, but especially when it becomes violent, especially when it turns on believers, begins to declare them non-believers, the Prophet ﷺ declared such people in Sahih Hadith to be kilabi ahl al the dogs of the people of the fire. Okay, They need more than this. You know, you've got to get into your heart. You've got to know why we believe and what we believe. And you, if you don't have an answer to the question, then just say you don't know. You know, but you should get the answers. And there are people that have them. And the traditional civilization of Islam, which is so alien to many Muslims today, that's what it was all about. It was about showing these truths to everyone and percolating them through the society in everything we had. Songs, even folk songs, you know, stories, beautiful stories, maybe about a man and his horse. There's an incredible story that uh, Nuri's father, Shams, you know, tells about the old man and his horse. Okay, and I don't think we have time to tell that story now, but these are stories that everyone loves, and they're about profound truths, and they bring it home. I mean, stories are such a good example of that, of you know, that mechanism which in the hands of a good storyteller, man or woman, can make everything make sense, right? Because it takes these truths which otherwise would only be accessible to a very few minds and a very few hearts, and it makes them clear to everyone in a metaphorical way, in a story. And this is what our whole civilization was about. You know, an incredibly beautiful, and I would say civilizations, because this is the gift that Muslims had for so long that wherever we went, we benefited. We were not people who were allergic to other people. 
In fact, in the history of humankind, we were the international civilization. And we were the link that could easily extend out to everybody else. Chinese, you know, Javanese, Indians, Hindus, Jains, Africans. Okay? We were good at that. You wouldn't believe that today, would you? Because today we're not good at it. We're not good at, in fact, we're usually very bad at it. And who do we blame? Ourselves. That's the one we need to blame. Because we have lost something. We've lost the master key. And we have to get that back. Um, how are we doing? When are we going to take a break? Sorry? Okay, so that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, you have to tell me. Well, you, you tell me. I mean, uh, okay, so let's stop here for some questions and answers. And, um, you know, then we take a break, all right? Yes. Beautiful, great, profound talk. Astaghfirullah. I'm always asking myself, does it make any sense at all? And, um, Western culture where we have grown up and all this uh, beauty is considered in the eyes of the beholder. Mm -hmm. We know that the eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So while we may project beauty mm -hmm. in different ways, mm -hmm. there are going to be people who may not mm -hmm. see it as beauty. Um, well, this is a very important thing. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And now that's something that can be interpreted our way or their way. Um, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, you know, um, is usually meant today to mean that beauty is subjective. And again, if we had more time, we could walk you through this. But, uh, you know, what the Western world, may God guide and bless the Western world, has done with beauty is very interesting and it always goes through stages that one of those things was to make beauty subjective and no westerner believed that in the past okay they knew better than that and um, but then gradually the definitions of beauty will change and, and especially in our time this would be a major axiom that beauty is subjective. And we would say that you, know, you can believe whatever you want, but um, it's not. It is objective. And you see, this is again one of the things about real beauty. It attracts. And it attracts everybody. It doesn't shock. And especially beauty in the Islamic civilization was done in such a way that everywhere your eye looks, it will rest. In you know, anything, a door, a window, the wall, that wherever your eye looks, it will rest. And we did that consciously. Okay? Now, uh, the beautiful things last forever. And the Taj Mahal of India, which is one of the most beautiful expressions of truth in stone in the world. And again, ideological Muslims would be ready to stand up that this was haram and how they did not. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't understand anything about politics. You don't understand anything about how that state was working. But let's forget about all that. You know, the Taj Mahal is absolutely beautiful. I've been there on the night of the full moon and the day before that. And, you know, it accentuates the beauty of the terrain, the beauty of the heavens and the earth. And uh, it was built by a Muslim ruler. And God forgive him if he, went, if he overdid it. But the thing is, it is so beautiful that everyone in the world acknowledges its beauty. And it became the logo of India. And this is because it embodies objective beauty. Uh, we go to Spain every summer and we have Azalea. Maybe you can come next year, which is a teaching session. 
you know, that goes on. And, you know, we'll take you to Granada. And there, if you haven't seen it before, you have Al Hamra, the great uh, fortress, you know, of Beni Ahmar in Granada, made of mud, clay. Again, typically Islamic architecture, tectonic to the nth degree. Our architecture was always tectonic. Tectonic means it fits the earth. It doesn't destroy the earth. We could talk about that, you know, for hours. Perfectly tectonic. And it never blocks out the signs of God. The Taj Mahal's like that. You go there the night of the full moon, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. See, it's there to emphasize the beauty of the moon. It's there to emphasize the beauty of the water. Everything else, that's always what we will do because architecture, which is the supreme form of art. Architecture is to art like metaphysics is to knowledge. You know, um, you know it, it, it's, it's the architecture and it's, not, it's got to bring out the signs of God in creation. And modern architecture always says, I am here, but it won't give you a resting point. You know, look, I mean, and again, modern architects, many of them are very aware of the fact that we need to create beautiful things. And this is a beautiful building. But most modern architecture, there's no place to rest your eye. You cannot rest your eye. <clears throat> but the building is saying, I am here. Look at me. And one of the worst examples of that in the Muslim world today is the clock tower in Mecca, which most of you probably have seen. This is one of the most horrific architectural obscenities in history. And what does it say? I am here. This giant clock. We don't even need a clock in Mecca. We've got the Avan. And it dwarfs the Kaaba. You know? And what is that? But this is something that has a long tradition in secular architecture. Okay, so the Hamra of Granada. Have you ever been there? It's got so many guests coming there all year long that they have to set quotas or they will harm the place. They can't take as many visitors as want to come. And they come from Japan. They come from China. <coughs> they come from every part of Europe. They come from the United States. They come from Africa, everywhere in the world. And does any of them ever say, this is ugly? They are in awe of it. So, you know, beauty is the splendor of truth. And in fact, I mean, let's not talk about that anymore. But you see, it's like it attracts. And one of the characteristics of this real beauty, which is the splendor of truth, is that it attracts everybody. Muslim, non-Muslim, hypocrite, believer, they all see it's beautiful. And again, it's thinking for you. It's thinking for you. And it's telling you messages that are very sweet and maybe you can follow them all the way home. Um, and you know, it's amazing because so many things in our history are just beautiful beyond words, although we're destroying them day after day. Um, do you know St. Basil's Basilica in Moscow, Red Square? All of you have seen it. You might not know what I'm talking about. But St. Basil's is that amazing basilica in Moscow, in Red Square, that has the funky domes. It looked like they ought to be in Disneyland. Okay? And they're really funny. They're beautiful. But the Russians love them. And so does the world. And St. Basil's became the logo of Russia under the Tsars and even under the Soviet Union. They put a big red star up there. Okay, and what is the background of St. Basil's Basilica? That was, those are the leftovers of a great mosque. And we don't say this to lament or to regret or to accuse, but those were the turrets and the minarets of the Jamia Mosque, the great mosque of Kazan, K-A-Z-A-N, in the central Volga. Because the Volga River 
before the formation of the Russian Empire was Tatar. And the Tatars are still there in Russia today. And the Tatars were Muslims. And the Tatars had been very powerful. They're called the Golden Horde and the White Horde. And they had beautiful little mosques, you know, which, you know, Ivan the Terrible didn't destroy, but they also had big Jamia mosques. And when he defeated them, then he destroyed those mosques. Yes. Uh, let, let's come back to that in a minute. So, um, we'll come back in one minute, okay? So, St. Basil's, you know, when Ivan the Terrible commanded that the great mosque of Kazan be destroyed, he also commanded that Muslim architects overlook the destruction of it and that they take as much of it as possible back to Moscow in bull carts and that they oversee the building of his basilica that would be made from the same materials. So the basilica is a basilica. It's a Christian architectural form. It is not a mosque. That's a no-brainer. But all of those materials were taken from the mosque. And again, the point is they are so beautiful, but at the same time, they hit a chord so profound in the Russian psyche that the Russians make that their logo. It becomes the symbol of Russia. So these are very important things, you know, and they do show what we believe, that beauty is ontological. Beauty is metaphysical. And it's something that if you get it right, it will speak to everyone in the room, whoever they are, except for some of us, some of us who are externalized. And that's another amazing thing about this phenomenon of externalized Islam, and they're not all the same. And we don't mean to say they are, but some of them, the destruction of this beauty, they regard to be virtually an obligation. And that is so wrong, so absolutely wrong. And we've got to get the full teaching back. You know, بإذن الله تعالى. Let me say one more thing about tectonic architecture. But before we do that, let's return to our sister. What was your statement about the Taj Mahal? Uh, Yeah, and, and this is the purpose of Islamic architecture, is to show you that God is great. I mean, I could give you pictures, but I don't have them ready. I just didn't have time to do that. Uh, but in, you know, when you look at some of these great mosques, like let's say, for example, some of the great mosques of Istanbul, they are majestic beyond words. I mean, they really are. But they are not saying, I am here. They are saying, God is glorious. Okay, and this is very, very important. This is a very important difference. Let me say something about tectonic architecture. Um, not far from Rosales, which is where we go in Granada, um, there is a Moorish house. And um, it's very beautiful, very beautiful, built by the Muslims years and years ago, and it's on a hill. When I went there, I said, this must be a commander's house, because in that particular valley, they had lots of commanders, because it is the strategic uh, zone where you have you know, uh, the crusaders on the other side of the mountain. So he needs to be able to watch the mountains in front of him, and he needs to be able to watch the valley behind him. And so he built, in this hill where he built the house, is perfectly situated for that. And, you know, it's just a hill, rocks. Okay, but when he built his house, and this is always what the Muslims in Spain and Portugal did, he didn't destroy anything. He made the house hug the hill. That's what we call tectonic. 
And so it just goes over the hill. And it has about three or four different levels. And the house is beautiful. You have to see it. I don't think you would ever disagree. And because he did it this way also, he has an incredible view of the valley, incredible view of the mountains, perfect airflow, incredible light distribution in the house, and other things like that. And uh, the house is like, you know, it just made to fit the mountain. But that is the secret of its beauty. Um, let's get some more questions. Okay, so mm, who put up their hand first over here? Was it you? Okay, let's go to you. How do we go about what? Reclaiming it? Yeah. Well, um, you know, um, first of all, we've got to learn it. And we've got to understand it. And this is a fad kifaya in our time. This, in my belief, is a societal obligation in our time. And our scholars have many things to do, and many of them are very mundane. And they have to do those well. But there must be among us scholars of tahqiq, scholars that understand what all of this means, and you know, who are able to understand how it relates to where we are. And they can't do that if they don't know how we got here. This is one of the, the worst things that has happened to the Muslim world, in my opinion. You're free to have your opinions. We adopted technology and modern sciences, especially engineering, that's the one that counts, it makes money, you know, and medicine, that's the one that makes money, and many others, and I know there are engineers among you and physicians, and I ask you to forgive me. And I don't mean anything bad about you. But the thing is, is that all of those sciences have world views. They have metaphysics or pseudo-metaphysics. You were never taught that. In fact, you were probably taught this is the truth. Just as when we're taught modern physics or astronomy, it's like this is the truth. No, it's not the truth. Modern philosophy of science knows it's, knows it's not the truth, but you won't be taught that. And you will be instructed and drilled year after year so that this becomes so deeply embedded in your mind and it becomes the foundation of everything that you think that you actually have imbibed, imbibed a different metaphysics. And this is extremely destructive. And again, we have this amazing ability to live with it together, but there's great disharmony. And that's why we find in our community that we have problems that we should never have with toleration, with um, you know, being beneficial to the society around us. Those are not traditional Muslim problems, ever. But they are today because of externalization. The externalization has that, you know, externalization means there is no understanding. There is no profound understanding. And people who have no understanding, you know, especially when they think they really know what's right because they're engineers. And engineers know that problems are very simple, and you've got very simple solutions. Well, reality doesn't work that way. Bridges do. Bridges do, but we, there's some differences between bridges and reality. So we've got to learn these things in a very sophisticated way. Um, Hassan Eaton, may Allah have mercy on him, is one of the stars in, in the galaxy. You know, uh, in, his, in, in his book, um, Islam and the destiny of man. One of the things he says is that the Muslim converts got to be a galactic traveler. You know, the Muslim convert must be a galactic traveler. Uh, unfortunately, you have to be one too, even though you're not a convert, but you're sort of like a convert because, you know, you've learned so many things here. And he said, because, <coughs> because there's like this galactic distance between where so many Muslims are today and where you happen to be. You know, coming out of the West, 
adopting the faith, and often when Muslims adopt the faith, we're not always very intelligent about that. And I wasn't either. I, mean, I believed in the faith. It's true. But I didn't have profound understanding of it. And like many people, I made mistakes that I would be embarrassed of today. I was so literalist you wouldn't believe. And I, but I had to be taught that, you know, that let's, let's sit down here at the table and read about usul al-fiqh a little bit, you know. And that helped me. It's like, oh my God. You know, so um, the convert doesn't always get it. Some of us, including myself, were very hard-headed. Extremely hard-headed, but alhamdulillah, recipient to a little bit of teaching here and there. But, um, you know, so we have to be these galactic travelers that know where the Muslims are today. You know, how they are thinking. And some of the big problems that we have today. And, you know, then know also what is over here in the West with this development of technology and science and all these other things. But we have to know that critically. And again, you're free to do whatever you want. You don't have to agree with me about Descartes or Kant or Francis Bacon or anything like that. But you do, you should be able to understand the discourse. And you should be able to understand how critical this is. So this is a big job. And this is what we call tahqiq, the realization of this formal knowledge in profound terms. And always in the transmission of the tradition, you have naql. You know, which is just the transmission of the texts, hopefully with ijaza, in which you learn how to read it properly. And if you have a good teacher, you learn to read between the lines also, because what is not said in the text is always more important than what is said. I hope that doesn't shock anyone. Even the Quran is like that. The Quran's silence is rich just as its speech is. And its silence, its speech comes out of silence. Qaf wal Qur'an al Majid. Okay? Qaf wal Qur'an al Majid. And then there is ellipsis. Bell. Okay? And in that ellipsis, there's something implied that's not said. That silence. We call it hadf and taqdeer. We need to be able to relate to that. Then the Qur'an really makes meaning. Okay, so uh, you have to be able to transmit the tradition. And our tradition is really rich, beyond words. Okay, but then you've got to be able to understand it. And you've got to be able to get it here where it teaches us what we've got to know. Okay, this is really important, and then it begins to work again. Okay, so this is what we've got to do, and I myself uh, would enjoy working towards this, because to me, this is really beautiful. Give us understanding of the whole world, the West, the past, the Muslim world. We've got to, we don't understand as a rule what we were and who we were and how our cities worked. How did we build our cities? How did we make them so beautiful? Um, you know, uh, we've got to learn these things. Just as, we, as, as you know, I don't, I don't remember if we said that before, but I believe that we did, you know. But in the building of an Islamic city, what is priority? Well, maybe it's not number one, but one of the biggest priorities. Have we said that today? You've got to feed your people. You've got to feed your people. That's Sharia. That is the, the prophetic law. But you cannot make your people depend on the outside because then they will be conquered. They will not be free. They will not be able to speak freely. They will be subservient to the people who import their food. Okay, and you might say, well, that's not a big issue. No, for us it is a big issue. The city needs to be self-sufficient. And our cities were. They're garden cities. And we did incredible permaculture. 
And then they've been, they're going to have areas around them, whether it's in Cairo or in Damascus or anywhere else, that can feed the whole city wonderfully. Most Muslim cities didn't have to import anything. I know of one city that they had to import three things. They just couldn't do for themselves. Coffee, needles, and razors. Now, that might make uh, a capitalist uh, toss in his sleep, <laughs> right? That like, so what about markets? Well, we had the best markets in the world. But our markets were about basically qualitative goods. Things that were not essential, but were very beneficial and, you know, very attractive. And then we would sell those because we were the biggest merchants going. If you want to talk about free market, oh, wow. We had free markets where everyone was free, even the poor. So um, let's get back to another question. Yes. OK, I'm so sorry. Pray for me. Um, pray that God gives me the ability to answer questions simply, you know, and not like to give a lecture on everything. Yes. Astaghfirullah. Amen, amen. And you and all of us, and may we all be there together. That's really true. That's really true. It, it, you, you say it's heartbreaking. I mean, this is the challenge of the time that, uh, you know, we have been designated as the enemy. And that's been going on for a long time. It didn't begin on 9 11, it began even before that. Um, and unfortunately, there are externalized Muslims who are very violent and who do things that are ugly in the eyes of the law, and who declare other Muslims to be disbelievers. And whenever you find a Muslim who declares other Muslims to be disbelievers, then you are dealing with the Khawarij. Uh, and I know that many people, they don't like to hear that. But the Khawarij are the ones who took the verse, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ and so therefore, if Ali, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, if he doesn't have a ruling that is clearly in the Qur'an, they would declare him to be a kafir. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ And those who do kufr, they also establish equals with their Lord, so they're also mushrikun. Okay, and the Prophet warned us about those people. And Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave us the best example of how to speak to them as brothers and beautifully to bring them back into the fold. But no Sunni ever took the verse, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ as the basis of the takfir of entire societies. We could go through the tafsir tradition. The Salaf didn't do that. No one did that. And it's not a valid tafsir to do that. Okay, but that's what our people today do. For the last 80 years, this has been a fitna in the Muslim world. And with things like uh, Daesh or ISIS, this has reached a crisis point. And what they do is ugly. And because they are tekfiris, the Prophet describes such people as kilabu ahlan naw. They are the dogs of the people of the fire. And he said about the Khawarij, they will shoot through Islam and out of Islam, like an arrow that's overshot, hits its prey and goes out, and it doesn't even have a trace of blood and it doesn't kill the prey. And he said also they die as non-Muslims. And he said about them also, sharrul khalqi wal khaliqa, this is sahih, and it's virtually mutawatir. 
They are the worst of creation and of khaliqa, which is animals. The worst of human beings. The worst of the people of the fire. And the worst of animals. They're worse than snakes and scorpions. Okay? Our prophet taught us that. And why did he teach us that? To protect ourselves. Who are they killing? You know, I just visited you know, a brother from Iraq who is one of the greatest members of our community. Uh, all of his family was killed in Mosul. Okay, now, um, you know, these things that are happening are just really the fitna of the time. And of course, Daesh, you know, they serve the purposes of the media, you know, to such a degree. And that's the image of Islam that the media wants, in my belief. Because this justifies an unjust foreign policy. This, un this justifies intervention. Look what happened to Iraq. Look what has happened to Syria. It cannot be spoken. And who cares? I care. You care. Nobody else does. Okay? And I gave a lecture at Princeton with slides, you know, um, about Muslims in, pre in America before Columbus, question mark. Okay? Um, don't want to say too much about it if you don't see it or hear it. But we have surprising evidence, even maps from Java, that show that we knew the coast of Brazil long before the Spanish ever came. Okay, so we were here. We have other evidence. And you don't have to believe me on that. I don't expect you to believe me on that. We've been here a long time. And we probably had interrelations with the First Nations. Possibly even with the Iroquois, the Cherokee, the Apache, and others, the Comanche. And again, I have to be really careful to even breathe that because these things have to be worked out very scientifically and very carefully, otherwise they're just rejected as lunatic. But the thing is, we do belong here. We have been here as long as anyone but the oldest First Nations. And then we had a presentation that we gave at New York University on, uh, was it Thursday, which was called uh, Muslims in Our American Past, 1587 till 1965. Again, you know, I've got lots of evidence, beautiful photographs. We begin with Roanoke Colony, the so-called lost colony of Roanoke. We know, and I have an article on this, uh, Turks, Moors, and Moriscos in early America. You can see it online if you like. But it is a historical fact that Drake, Sir Francis Drake, brought to that colony in the first year of its existence over 200 Muslim galley slaves that he had freed in the Caribbean. Okay, um, That is a historical fact. Now, what became of them? Well, we don't really know. Some of them were taken back. But we don't really know, but then we have some interesting things in our history, like a people called the Melungeons from Tennessee and Kentucky, who are not Native Americans. And they never have been. They don't have dances. They don't have Native American languages. They don't have legends or anything like that. They are a Mediterranean-looking people. And they were here before the British colonists came, in every case. The Melungeons. Okay, and they say they go back to Roanoke. And they called themselves Portuguese Moors. And you don't have to believe it. And they said that we were known as Mecca Indians. They're not Indians, but they would face Mecca and they would bow. So people called them Mecca Indians. Again, is that really true? Is that history? Well, we don't know for sure, but it certainly has an element of truth. And who is the Melungeon? Well, you know, you, if you start counting, you won't stop. But you could begin with Abraham Lincoln, you know, with Clark Gable, Elvis Presley, um, Tom Hanks. Those people have Melungeon roots. And who's more American than Abraham Lincoln? But he does look funny, doesn't he? <laughs> and so does Clark Gable, and so does Elvis Presley. 
And uh, then we went to New York City. And in New York City, um, you know, I showed the picture of Humphrey Bogart, Jacqueline Kennedy, First Lady, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was one of the great fathers of the Vanderbilt family, uh, Eli Whitney. And I said, what do you think they have in common? So people say, well, Melungeons. But they weren't Melungeons. They have, and also Anderson Cooper, you know, who is their ancestor, Murad Rais. They are all the descendants of their grandfather, great, great, great grandfather, Murad Rais, who was the Dutch Corsair, who was the president and chief admiral of the Muslim Republic of Salah, Saleh in Morocco. And he's well known. That's their grandfather. And he fought against the Spanish the entire period of the 80 years war of Dutch independence. And um, his son, Anthony Fonsali, who's one of his five sons, he came to New York as a Muslim, speaking Arabic, reciting the Quran in 1630. He was very wealthy. His father was one of the wealth wealthiest people on earth. And he became one of the biggest landowners, proprietors, and creditors in Manhattan. And he had a big farm outside of Wall Street. Wall Street was not where the stock market was. The Dutch didn't have a stock market. It's uh, where the wall was between the city and you know, the rest of the island. And um, he was a defender of minorities. And he was swarthy. His mother was a dark woman, they say a Moorish woman. Her name was Margarita. And he defended minorities, and he was guilty of many crimes, such as keeping an English Quaker in his house. And uh, the Church of Holland, the Dutch church, didn't like him. And they had big problems with him. And he was also very outspoken. He was very tall, very strong, and dark. And he defended the minorities, and they wanted him out of Manhattan, which he was a major landowner in. And so uh, he was banished from Manhattan. At least he couldn't live there anymore. And so he said, well, what about Brooklyn? And so they let him go to Brooklyn. And he became one of the founders of Brooklyn. And he became, in a matter of years, one of the biggest landowners in Long Island. And again, he was regarded to be antisocial. And one of his common antisocial acts was that he would put loaded pistols in people's faces. That's pretty bad. But whose faces? Slave drivers. Slave drivers. So this is American history. And who's more American than, um, you know, uh, Humphrey Bogart or Anderson Cooper? And that's Anderson Cooper's grandfather. So we didn't come here yesterday. And then after that, and I'm not going to belabor this, but then we went to George Bethune English, who was um, valedictorian of Harvard University, who wrote a thesis on the origins of Christianity that gave him a major prize. I think it's called Boy Boydon Prize. Boydon, I don't know, you know how to pronounce it. So. Um, and um, English. Uh, was from Boston. Yeah, right here from Boston. And uh, English um, wrote a book then about the origins of Christianity, which says that basically the origins are difficult to prove. <laughs> and for me, he said, that's a problem. He was excommunicated from the church. But he was a very good friend of James Madison and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And uh, James Madison appointed him to the Marines as a second lieutenant. The Marines in those days was the American Armed Forces, because the Marines was the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard all put together. And as a Marine captain, you know, uh, he sailed in the Mediterranean, and he was able to stop in Egypt. And he stopped in Egypt for a time. And in fact, he even resigned 
from the Marines in Egypt because he wanted to stay there. And he studied Islam with Egyptian scholars and Arabic, and he became a Muslim. And he took the name Muhammad Effendi. And in those days, uh, Egypt was under Ottoman rule. And Ottoman Turkish, you know, was the dominant, the ruling language of Egypt. And that's why, you know, Egyptians would say things like Effendim. What do you mean? That's Turkish. Why are you speaking Turkish? Well, because that's what people spoke. Um, if you want to talk to the ruler, you have to say Effendim. You know, and uh, so he learned Turkish so well that the Turks couldn't believe he wasn't a Turk. And he was decorated by the Turks. He served uh, Ishmael Pasha. And James Madison respected him tremendously always. They had a really close friend, uh, friendship. And then President John Adams, after Madison, he sent George Bethune English uh, with a special letter to the Ottoman Sultan stating explicitly that, um, that Muslims would be welcomed in America just like Christians. And they would have the same rights. And that's a common thing among the founding fathers. And before them, people like Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, that Turks, meaning then Muslims, they're welcome here just like Jews. And he would say Papists as well, you know, Catholics. All these people should be welcome here. And um, George Bethune English, we have, I found only one image of him, which is a beautiful painting of him with his turban. And if you'd seen my presentation, you would have seen it. You know, but, um, and then we can go on and on. So we haven't talked about the Africans yet. We haven't talked about, who, who was the, the immigrants? We didn't talk about them. You, many of you are immigrants or the children of immigrants. Who was the first Muslim immigrant we know of in the United States? Actually, there were people before him. But the famous first one comes over in 1856. And who is that? Hi, Jolly. Hi, Jolly, H-I, Jolly, J-O-L-L-Y. What was his name? Haj Ali. Haj Ali. But when he would tell people his name was Haj Ali, they just said, hi, Jolly. <laughs> Hi, Jolly, what a good name you've got. <laughs> and Hi, Jolly was brought here in 1856 by American Congress from Jordan because he was a camel master. And, you know, um, Jefferson Davis, who was the Secretary of War at that time, and Franklin Pierce, who was the president, they came up with this screwball idea that after the Gasden Purchase and after all this Southwest territory of the United States came into the United States, which is desert and hot, that they've got to have a camel corps. And you know, the horse soldiers, the cavalry, will be trained in riding camels. Then they can defend the area, they can carry freight, and we'll finish in a minute, and, um, you know, everything will be wonderful. So they need 77 camels, and they bring over Hai Jolly to take care of the camels, and probably others with him. And uh, that's what he does. The thing is, is that the cavalry didn't like the camels. They didn't want to ride camels. They didn't want to be camel jockeys, right? So, uh, and then also they found out that camels were really bad news because camels, I don't know why, they love donkeys, and they love mules. And if you want to make camels happy, you just have to put a donkey with them. You'll never see a caravan of camels, I don't think, but there will always be a donkey there somewhere, or a mule. And for some reason, camels just really like that. So the one pack animal you did have in the Midwest, in the Southwest, were pack mules. And whenever the camels would see mules, they would go crazy. And they start, you can't hold them back. It's like, we have to see these mules. You know, so they go running to the mules, and the mules see these giant camels, come, and they bolt, and they run, and they, they throw off their, so they said, get rid of the camels. Okay, and then of course, the Civil War came. And when the Civil War came, then everybody has to leave the Southwest. It's like, you've got another problem. Hi Jolly didn't leave, he stayed there. And he took care of his camels for the rest of his life. 
And he was decorated by the State Department. And his tomb is there in Quartzsite, Arizona. I visited it myself. And there you see that he was decorated by the army, okay, and the State Department. And then he married a beautiful woman from Tucson. And I have a picture of that, you know. She's standing and he's sitting. Uh, forgive me, uh, he was a Jordanian Arab. And he's sitting like this, you know, and she's standing up, but she's a beautiful bride. And he had two children. You know, don't tell me that we are not part of this country. Uh, I wrote a book on Alexander Russell Webb, who's an amazing man. And it's really telling America's story through him. He was like a, more, uh, a Muslim Horace Gump, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. So you want to know about the Chicago fire? Well, was Webb there? Of course he was there. He was there. <laughs> All right, so you can tell the, forest the, the, the Chicago fire story through Webb's eyes because he'll always be in the unfortunate place. You know, and uh, Jesse James, anything else, it's like he's done a report on Jesse James. You know, so uh, it's, it's an amazing story, but and, and this is one of the things, you know, that I noted. Uh, one that I wanted to tell this story because I wasn't interested in our image or anything like that. But the thing is, is that um, Webb is an American. He believed that Islam is completely compatible with America. And in fact, he believed that America cannot live up to its values without Islam. Because Webb was very concerned about uh, white supremacy, racism. And he knew that Islam can take care of that problem. So, um, you know, and you're going to tell me these people are not Americans? But again, that's a message today which many people don't want to be heard. And I'm not conspiratorial. I don't have any complaints. But when the book came out, Oxford University Press in New York, um, it appeared in the very center of the New York Review of Books in the top left-hand corner. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's like, my God, my book is right there. Everybody will see it. I mean, I'd like that, but I didn't believe that I would score like that. It was right there in the middle of the New York Review of Books in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, and then the review came out the next week and it was nowhere. And it never appeared again. And, you know, so I believe that it got where it was the first time because of my editor, because he loved the book. And he said, this is what America needs to hear. But I don't think that everybody at Oxford University Press in New York must have agreed, because after that, it was silent. In fact, I went to the House of Lords in London, and I was given a special presentation in what's called the Moses Room, and many publishers came to that from England around the world. It was publicized. And you know, we were asking Oxford University Press to have many boxes of the book present because, present, because that's usually what publishers do. If they like the book, they'll buy boxes of it right there. And again, Oxford in England couldn't get the book. Otherwise, they would have provided it. But Oxford in New York, they are the ones that had the book. And they sent two boxes, two boxes. Whereas we could have easily distributed or sold as many boxes as you can imagine. So again, it's like, is something going on here? And um, in my, my case, I don't have any issues. Uh, we just do what is right. We do the best we can do. But the way that media today, or certain elements in the media, tries to shape reality, and the way that they very subjectively take certain images and distort them and generalize them and never tell the full story either, and then exclude everything else, uh, that is very problematic. And I would say, and you know, God forgive me if I'm wrong, and may I see the truth if I am, that this is imperial propaganda to justify um, certain foreign policies which are never discussed, you know, and um, to have images of Islam which are really ugly, that no human being could do anything but hate. And then that's you too, and that's me too. 
And that's all of us. And this is why we have got to do our work and we have got to get that real image out there. And it is shocking in the United States how central we are to American history, how absolutely central we are. We could talk about that a lot. And, but that's a story that some people don't want to be told today. And inshallah, Allah give us tawfiq. We have Keith Ellison, who's a, a good congressman from Minnesota. Yeah. And, you know, he took his oath of allegiance on Jefferson's Quran. And Jefferson really admired the Quran. And in fact, Jefferson, like Obama, was often accused by his opponents of being a Muslim. Interesting. But Jefferson knew about Islam. And so did Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin has states about, statements about Islam and Islamic history that are just amazing. You know, he knew, for example, that Muslims never mistreat prisoners of war. And he has beautiful statements about that. You know, um, and he knew that from the life of Umar and from other things like that. So, um, you know, about Keith Ellison, he says, you know, if you're not at the table, you will be on the menu. And this is one of the truths of political life. I'm not a politician, and I, I would be the worst politician in the world if I was. You know, but, um, you know, we have got to be doing our work. And you cannot just be sad and go into the corner and cry. You know, maybe you can, you know, and maybe some of us can but others have got to stand up and begin to do this work really intelligently and in a beautiful way. And um, inshallah, uh, you know, uh, Allah will give us a beautiful way forward. So um, we're going to take a break now, okay? We'll see you after the break. <laughs>